the beginning was the Big Bang. We are told that 13 to 20 billion years ago, everything that makes up the universe as we know it was spontaneously created out of nothing through an unimaginably violent explosion. But did it really happen as we are told? A growing number of astronomers doubt it and are showing why. This is their story, the story of the universe. The um, observational aspects of uh, trying to understand the universe, I think it's reasonable to start about 100 years ago. And about 100 years ago, almost everybody in astronomy without question assumed that the whole of the universe was what you could see in the Milky Way. Nobody felt they could, that the universe was any bigger than the, than the stars that you see in the sky associated with our own local Milky Way. And that was the situation certainly around 1905, times like that. There are well-known people who propounded these ideas. Ten years later, Einstein first proposed his general theory of relativity. Now, when Einstein proposed this, it's a theory of gravity, which means that it's a theory which should represent the whole of the universe because it's gravitational forces that are controlling the universe. Well, Einstein made this theory around 1915, and uh, he immediately wanted to try and use this theory to explain the universe as it then was, the so-called Milky Way system. But of course, the idea of this was that it was a static system. That is, it wasn't contracting or expanding. It was a static system. And Einstein found that his equations did not allow for a static universe unless he inserted a certain constant in the mathematics, which was, became known as the cosmological constant. But what happened in the early 1920s was that a very a clever Russian called Friedman in 1922 found solutions to Einstein's equations which allow the universe to either expand or contract. Now that was done in, in, the, in the Soviet Union uh, soon after the revolution, and nobody in the West knew about this, I think. But in 1927, a Belgian, a Belgian priest, the Abbe Lemaitre, as he later became, uh, also discovered these solutions. And uh, he uh, went to England and his work was uh, publicized in Cambridge and elsewhere, and the famous uh, English astronomer Sir Arthur Eddington and others got to know about this, and they immediately began to say, how can this apply to the current universe? Well, in the same period, in 1929, Hubble made what I still believe was the most important discovery in extragalactic astronomy in the last century, or the last century but one, he showed that if you look at the, the, the spiral nebulae, the faint spiral nebulae, the shifts in their spectra are proportional to their apparent brightnesses. And this led very soon to the idea that this fitted very well with the expanding universe and that indeed uh, this is the kind of universe we lived in, that what we were looking at are, are galaxies, Milky Ways, further and further away from us. And the further away from us, the larger the red shifts. And if that's interpreted in the way that most people would interpret it, this means that they are moving away faster and faster. So this was the original idea by the 1930s. The front page of the New York Times said, we live in an expanding universe. When Hubble made his great discovery, it was for galaxies like our own Milky Way galaxy. And they all followed the same rule, 
that the fainter they are, the larger their redshift. In other words, the faster they are moving away from us. This is known as the Hubble Law and directly led to the expanding universe theories. But in the 1960s, there was a new discovery, the quasi-stellar objects, often referred to as quasars. They appear as star-like points on the sky, frequently blue in color, and they have very, very large redshifts, implying that they are at huge distances from the Earth, at the very boundaries of the observable universe. Some astronomers soon found that a vast number of these strange new objects populated the regions around spiral galaxies and were not only observable with radio telescopes, but were optical and X-ray sources as well. There were two properties of the quasars that were difficult for astronomers to understand using the expanding universe theory. The first was that if one plotted their apparent brightness against their redshifts, as one does for galaxies, one gets an unexpected scatter on the diagram, instead of the smooth curve made by the same plot done for galaxies. This seems to indicate that the quasars do not follow the Hubble law as do most other objects, and that there is no direct indication that they are actually at their proposed redshift distances. In fact, it is argued that if Hubble had first been given the plots for quasars, he and other astronomers would never have concluded that the universe was expanding. The second property was that quasars are very small, compact objects, sometimes only a light year across. So if quasars are really at their extreme redshift distances, they must then be the brightest and most energetic objects known to astronomers. So energetic, in fact, that untestable, almost metaphysical mechanisms must be applied to explain the phenomena. On the other hand, when placed at their observed distances, that is, in the neighborhood of nearby galaxies, their brightness and energies become normal, and no special mechanisms need to be evoked. This problem has led many astronomers to abandon the idea that all redshifts are due to their speed of recession away from the Earth. And if this is true, then there is no need for an expanding universe, and the Big Bang never happened. The questions arise. Is there a connection between certain types of galaxies and the quasar? Are quasars ejected from galaxies, and in fact proto-galaxies themselves? Is there some other astrophysical process which can explain the redshift discrepancies? One of the world's most controversial experts on the structure and morphology of quasars, Halton C. Arp, has for 35 years proposed just such an idea. For the heresy of opposing orthodox interpretations of the redshift problem, Arp has had to pay a heavy price, the same price paid by many a scientist with new and innovative ideas. Dr. Arp was forced to resign from his permanent position at the Carnegie Institute of Washington Observatories after the Caltech head of the Telescope Allocation Committee threatened him by saying, unless he changed his line of research, they would take away his telescope time. Due to this fact and his ongoing struggle against the established paradigms, Arp is often referred to as the modern Galileo. I remember when I sent the paper into uh the first paper into Astrophysical Journal uh, on, on the nature of companion galaxies, and I had a lot of them on the ends of spiral arms, so I was sure that they were connected, and I showed that they were systematically redshifted. I sent that in with, with, with naive, great expectations that people would be terribly interested and impressed on this, and the editor of the Astrophysical Journal at that time was Subramanian Chandrasekhar, who had a fantastic reputation as a, as a master theoretician and also quite an incomprehensible theoretician, and a, and a tremendously powerful uh, figure in the, in the field and editor of the Astrophysical Journal, which is probably the most powerful position in the field. And uh, he 
chose not to, in his wisdom and judicial fairness, chose not to send it to a referee, but he just wrote across the paper, this exceeds my imagination, and he sent it back to the director of my institute, Horace Babcock, with the obvious implication, you've got to do something about this, this uh, staff member of yours who's, who's doing these very things. And so Horace called me down in the office one day after this, and I walked in the, his office, into the director's office, and I saw this paper lying on, in front of him with Chandra Sekar's scrawl across it. And Horace looked at me and, and said, well, he said, this is just too, too much, and, and, and you're going to have to uh, uh, start looking for another job. And so all I could say to him was, well, if you send me that in writing, please send me in, in writing. And I was waiting in great trepidation for it for weeks and months to get something in writing, and I finally never did, so I realized that he decided to give me another chance, so to speak. Uh, so that was fairly early in the game, and then some years went by, and there was the, the, the competition for time, particularly on the 200-inch telescope, was getting more and more heated, and, and people were saying, well, we can't continue to give time to this obviously incorrect and embarrassing research that ARP does. So finally they sent uh, a letter to me from the allocation committee, including a number of the younger members of my, of my institute, saying that unless I changed my line of research, that they would have to take away my telescope time. At that point I considered the situation very carefully and I figured that the the evidence, although a lot more evidence could be gathered and has since been gathered since then, the important thing was not the evidence, uh, because if it was true it would come out someday, the important thing was the principle of scientific investigation, whether people, whether scientists could follow uh, new lines of investigation and follow up on, a, on, on evidence which apparently contradicted the current uh, theorems and the current paradigms. And I also felt that regardless of what happened to me personally, that this was the important issue and that, that I had no choice but to resign on the point of this issue so that if it developed, which I thought it would, that the, my line of investigation was correct, that people then within the future would say, okay, this was the wrong thing to do, and in the future, we're going to have to see that this kind of thing doesn't happen again. The observers come in now with the belief that we live in a Big Bang universe, and therefore all of their ways of understanding things are tailored to that. And they don't come in with the possibility that, that this, or that our alternative, or any other for that matter, is right and really do it in an open-minded way. And of course, what goes along with that is that observers who would like to test this way find it very hard to get observing time and so on. I mean, this relates to the whole issue of whether of the, 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 the complete lack of balance in the, in the way the observational programs and the funding are conducted. There's no question about that. I don't think that anybody would argue about it. Uh, I've always said that the cause of the troubles is the American.